Hi, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Emily Russo and I am the co-owner of Print a Bookstore in Portland, Maine. A few housekeeping details before we start. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to enter them in the chat box or on the bottom, on the bottom right or in the Q&A function, which is on the bottom bar of the Zoom window. If you'd like a copy of the music book, I will include the link to the print page in the chat box. And now on to our speakers. Shannon Krogsrud is the co-founder of Runaways Run Club, a Maine-based weekly running meetup. Karen Osborne is the author of Patchwork, Between Earth and Sky, The River Road, Centerville, and now the music book. She lives in Amherst, Massachusetts with her husband and teaches fiction writing in the MFA program at Fairfield University. Please join me in virtually welcoming Shannon Krogsrud and Karen Osborne. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Um, Print is a wonderful local bookstore. Um, it's one that I, that uh, Karen was up visiting in Portland. We stopped by Print. To pick out a book together for my class. So I'll also add. Uh, so Karen, I'm so glad that we get to talk a little bit about your book, The Music Book. Yeah, me too. I'm excited. <laughs> um, before we get into talking about the book, I want to add just a couple of notes um, about Karen and, and, and some of the reviews that she's gotten because it's some, it's some good stuff. Um, the New York Times has called her work psychologically sophisticated and the Washington Post has said that her writing is an extraordinary effort to engage the American condition as we find it now. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> let's get into the music book. Um, the music book tells the story of Irina Seisel, who is a young female cellist with a fierce passion for music and desire to play among the best. Um, it starts in the 1950s, which is a time when orchestral groups refused women even the chance to audition. Um, in this time, Irina is given the opportunity to substitute for a modern up and coming quartet at a music festival where Irina is the only female musician. Years later, in the memory unit of a nursing home, Irina recalls through flashes her unsettling relationship with the group's enigmatic composer when she receives a sonata he left for her in his will. She relives the four days she spent with him and the difficult aftermath of the affair and the few other times that she saw him during her life. As her mind starts to shut down, she re-experiences the intense joy she felt performing music and her struggle to enter a male dominated world. So that's a little bit about the music book. Um, my experience in reading it, uh, it's a quick and profoundly moving read. Uh, I think it took me three sittings over about a week to get through it. Um, the pages go quickly and I found myself completely caught up in the emotions of Irina or Rini as she is referred to through a lot of the book um, and what she was feeling in the story really beautifully captures the exquisite moments of joy and the devastating disappointments. And at the time, and, and still even now, um, the everyday concessions a woman would have to make to inhabit a male dominated world. And in the two times that I've read it now, I have cried both times. So there's a little, a little <laughs> testament to it. <laughs> um, so Karen, um, what inspired you to write this story? Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for all those words about the book. Um, uh, well, the book, the book is uh, centered on a cellist and there is a lot about music in it um, and the experience of playing music. It's also a love story or maybe a failed love story, uh, a story about failed love. Um, but, um, the um, I, I was inspired uh, to write about music um, in part just because I've always loved music. You know, my parents um, loved classical music, so I heard it early growing up. Um, and my sister is a classical pianist uh, in Boston and performs uh, frequently. So, um, so, so she's definitely part of the inspiration for this. 
Um, I think also, I was talking to somebody today who had uh, finished reading it, and she is also a music lover and a musician. She plays a musical instrument. She's sung in a lot of choruses, and she kept saying, you know, how did you, you're not, you don't even play an instrument. Like, how did you get this? How did you get what it's like to, to the, the, the thrill of, of playing music? And I realized when I was talking to her that um, I think that um, I, I was inspired to write it in part because of my love for the arts in general and my, um, my total commitment really to um, the world of the imagination. Um, and, you know, my, my father uh, was a painter, he, he, watercolor painter, and my uh, another sister who's an artist. So we had a lot of discussions um, over the years about creativity and what that brings to a life. And so um, in many ways, I think, you know, I was writing about the experience of being in the imagination and the the beauty and the passion and the depth that that can give your life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I would agree that you, you do capture when you're writing about the music, this, this joy and this excitement and this thrill, um, which I imagine would be difficult to difficult to capture, especially if you are not a musician. So I think that that was really, really wonderful. <laughs> The testament to your talent. <laughs> well, it's funny that those um, passages came fairly easy. The language for them came surprisingly easily, but, uh, you know, and, and not all passages do at all. But I think that it is in part because I, I have this very deep commitment to the uh, imagine, imagine, uh, the imagination, the, the kind of role that that plays in one's life. Absolutely. Um, would you read a section of that now, a section of the, of the music being performed so that we can feel the excitement and the joy that Rini felt when she was performing? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'll just read a couple of pages. Um, and this is from the um, part way into the book. Um, there are four different concerts at this festival and Rini plays in the final concert. And she's playing this, the composer Arthur Cohen's music, and and she's been, um, and she's become involved with him very quickly over those those four intense days of playing music with them. And so this is there are four of them in the quartet, and this is the very the, the end the second part of the of the concert. So it's the ending of it after the after the intermission. Um, Rini's cello followed the music's thread. It developed in the first measures, disappeared for whole lines, then reappeared, suddenly rising to the surface, bobbing there for several measures before coming into full view. The melody lay mostly beneath her grasp, even with the repetitions in the coda, but in the moments when it surfaced, a world unlike any other composers unfolded. The sun was setting in the windows at the back of the hall. This is taking place in Newport, by the way, in the uh, Breakers Mansion. So it's in the great hall of that, this beautiful room. The lot of windows in the back. Um, so the sun is setting in, that, in those windows, tiny and orange and glittering. Arthur and Charles' high notes ended the second movement. Then after a brief pause, Rini entered the music again as the final movement began. The tempo increased and next to her, Charles bowed furiously. It felt impossibly fast, and for a second she was afraid she'd lose a note, but she didn't. Her instrument had its own life. Waves of sound swept through her. They were coming from her cello, but the sound felt bigger than that, as if it was its own entity rising. They played on and on, and the music stopped making sense as phrases became disconnected and hard to follow. Then all at once, everything snapped. She played a wrong note and had to focus completely on the score. For a second, she lost the others, stopped hearing them, but then suddenly she was with them again, right where she should be in the music. The four of them were communicating, creating something substantial and new between them. Her playing became more assured and vigor vigorous. Colors materialized out of the notes, tangible and real, having nothing to do with the colors from the audience of the setting sun. 
She saw purples and blues, crimsons, tawny browns, each musical phrase built upon the others. She felt her body vibrating with the cello, her arm pulled back and forth on the bow, her chest could barely stand the pressure. Any minute her heart would explode. Then the tempo changed again and the notes howled. They pushed her into another dimension. Every note switched on, every nerve switched on, and in a cacophony of sound, time spread out, diffuse and unmoving. What the four of them were making was beyond understanding or language, beyond reason. Music was time and tempo, tempo demanded precise counting, but they had exploded time's boundaries. In that moment, she knew absolutely what she was meant to do for the rest of her life, perform like this. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's so vivid in the way that it's written that it's hard to imagine that you could have written this without having heard that piece of music. Did you have a certain certain piece of music or a certain composer in mind that you would listen to when you were writing this? No, I have to say, I listened to a lot of classical music when I was writing it, but a lot of different composers. This is a, um, so Arthur Cohen is a, is a modern composer and um, you have to learn how to, I had to learn how to listen to modern music through my sister. Um, uh, although some of it I find very beautiful. So I was experimenting with a lot of modern musicians and listening to their, to their work, some of whom I knew and some of whom I didn't. There's a composer named George Crumb and um, I did a, um, I did a, uh, made it, in fact, I made a video with uh, a cellist, a wonderful cellist, Kate Kayan. And um, she, when she read it, she immediately thought of George Crumb. And um, so I went back and listened to more of him. And um, his music is beautiful. Anyway, it, she, there's a, a recording of her playing uh, a piece that this composer made her think of. Um, classic, uh, you know, modern music is not like Bach or Beethoven. It doesn't yeah. have a clear melody often, yeah. but it can be very expressive emotionally. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a theme that comes up a lot in the book as they're, as they're discussing. There's a lot of opinions of the times around classical music versus modern music. And, yeah. you know, it is, it is very different. And, and Arthur was, was pushing some boundaries for yeah. sure as he continued to do. Yeah, it was, it was a, an argument that was going on. And I found it so interesting because it was also political in that um, after World War II, um, the um, a lot of composers, m the major composers, had, a, lot, a lot of them had been German, and there had been a real emphasis on regularity and, you know, doing the expect, you know, following the expected melody and building these patterns that were very predictable, and uh, there was a lot of um, concern about that. That that was similar to. Uh, some of the things that had been uh, happened with the Third Reich, and that so there was a, so part of the rebellion against classical music and wanting to go in a new direction came from that. Yeah, and 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 Arthur really just kind of came in and and threw it all aside and and stirred some things up, which I think um, for Rini especially as a as a young musician just out of the conservatory really uh, gravitated towards. Um, yeah. which, which we see, um, we see in a little bit in that section, you can see the two of them playing together and see that the chemistry that they have where they're both experiencing the same thing and, and feeling the same thing. And, and that really only solidifies their attraction and her attraction to him in particular. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that relationship and maybe how it shaped Rini's time in Newport and how she saw her future? Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's very young, so she's just graduated from the conservatory, and um, and she uh, um, and and Arthur is several years older than her. And in addition, he's um, in her eyes, he's kind of made it because um, he's an up and coming composer and pianist, and 
Um, this, you know, playing with this quartet is the um, pinnacle of anything she's ever done before in terms of performance and playing with other musicians. And it really stretches her. A lot of the rehearsals are very difficult for her um, and, and upsetting because um, she feels in over her head very quickly. She hasn't played modern music before, for one thing, or much of it. Um, and so, and he pushes her, he pushes the whole group very hard, because um, this is a big premiere and it's, it's, um, it's, um, this is at a time period, kind of when classical music was really at its pinnacle of popularity. So this is a, you know, it was a very large audience. So a couple, over 200 people, you know, she's never played in that big of an audience wow. before. And, um, and so she, um, you know, she's, um, she admires him, I think, and, uh, and she's in a position of, um, of wanting his approval, um, because, you know, she hopes to keep playing with this quartet that she's acting as a substitute for, and they, they seem to really like her playing one of the other members um, says, keep saying to her over and over again that she'd be the great fourth member and they could be one of the first uh, professional quartets to have a woman, their modern quartet, that would, he likes that idea. But, um, and then, and then I think one of the reasons Arthur and she connect so much also is because they have this intense experience together um, of four days of being together a lot of that time and they both love music so much and they're so passionate about it. So that's this huge connection that she hasn't felt before. And, uh, and so in her mind, um, the way you do sometimes when you get carried away, I think, um, in the moment of those kinds of, emo um, those ki that kind of attraction and those kinds of emotions, um, she envisions that it's almost as if she can already see that they're going to have this life together and she's going to move to New York. And despite, you know, and then maybe doesn't see some of the, um, you know, the way in which your hope then uh, prevents you from seeing um, reality or from, from catching um, other clues that maybe it's not going exactly in the direction she thinks sure. it is. Sure. And I mean, who hasn't been there at some point, right? That's, that's a universal experience. So it's very relatable. Um, it's the experience of hope, right? Which is yeah, so human. Yeah, like we all, yeah. we all hope. We're all filled with hope yeah, right now. Yeah, exactly. And that, that continues on in some ways, you know, as the book goes on, it, it goes through some of the other moments in which they're reunited. Um, and and, and how, how that changes and how, how they change and how their lives go on. Um, so what would you say about their relationship and how that evolves as time passes on? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, she sees him a few, so it's, it's the events that happen at, during the festival, the four days yeah. of this festival. Right. And then there's the few times when she sees him right after the festival and kind of the sort of the fallout from, you know, all that's happened. And then it's the other, like just a few handful of times that she sees him. And one of them is like 20 years later. And then the next, the last couple. And then there's another one that's, you know, again, another 15 or so years later. So they're spread apart. But um, I think the, the thing that's um, remarkable or interesting about that, and this is the part of the mystery of, of of, of the character and, and, and the way in which sometimes you just don't really understand your own feelings and your own experiences is that each time she sees him, she can't help herself. She has these strong feelings for him again, despite knowing sort of more about who he is and being able to see him more clearly. Um, and um, there's a way in which, you know, um, I'm, the phrase um, who's playing who is was kind of in my mind a lot when I was writing that because like yeah. Rini's playing the cello, but in a way the cello's playing her as well. You know, the instrument sort of, she feels like the instrument takes over sometimes. I got that from a student of mine, by the way, who played, who played the cello. I interviewed wow. her when I was writing the book, one of my students from Mount Holyoke. Yeah, yeah, so the way in which, you know, your body is wrapped around a cello, so it's very much feels like, you know, are you playing it, or is it the thing that's making you 
play. Mm. Um, you kind of meld with it in a way that you might not with an, even as much with another instrument. But um, yeah, that, um, that, that then, uh, and then in many ways, he's playing her <laughs> throughout the whole thing, uh, the way one person can play another. And, um, and she knows that, but she still is, uh, despite that, has strong feelings yeah. for him. I think by the time, the last uh, time she sees him when she's older, and that's when she's, or, um, she's kind of made it uh, what she wants. She's made, she's succeeded in her goal, which seemed unreachable when she was younger, which was to play with a, a major symphony orchestra as a cellist. She's the first cellist to be hired by the city's, um, by Boston's major symphony orchestra. And so she, um, I think by then she uh, has a little bit of perspective on it, uh, more perspective, even though uh, she can't quite help her feelings. And, uh, and she's satisfied in many ways by then with her own life. Yeah. Yeah. It is, um, it's an interesting um, aspect of the book, how you kind of play with the concept of time and the different perspectives. Um, it's, you know, there's this, there's this very long section of the Newport Festival that just, you know, goes on and on and on and on, almost stretches out endlessly. And then you have these shorter, and they kind of get a little bit shorter as, as she goes on um, and as her life goes on. Um, and then, of course, as we talked about with the plot, that the, um, the perspective is through her memories and what she's remembering years, years and years later in a memory unit. Um, and that as her memory is going, the book flashes between these current stilted moments of lucidity and things that she's hearing in this memory unit and then kind of melds into these vivid and rich former memories that she had. So I have a little section of that to, to read um, if that's, if that sounds good to you. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'd love to hear you read it. Let me find it. I'll try to do it justice. <laughs> Let's see. Here it is. So the first, um, the first section of this is some different voices that she's hearing. Um, her, her daughter ha comes to visit her often when she's there and she hears little snippets of, of what she's saying as well as what other, um, other attendants or nurses in this memory unit would be saying. Mother, did you hear me? I'm coming later tomorrow around five. I'll bring Kia with me to see you. Mother, that concert is all arranged. It will be in a few weeks. It's a concert of the, of the Sonata that Arthur has um, gifted her in his will. Arthur Cohen's niece says it will be wonderful. It will lift your spirits. She heard what they said, heard voices and steps in the hallway, heard an orchestra playing, heard air moving through the vents and the sound of a, monitor, a motor beneath everything else. It went on day and night, a beautiful sound, a difficult sound. The sound she'd always known and that was always present. She had heard it and knew she had to continue, couldn't stop. She stood on a narrow strip and saw that she had no choice. The sound that was larger than her would not let go. And later, when she had walked so far and could go no further, she would see how far she'd come and where the end lay. So that's, um, that's the perspective from her as she's older and as she's remembering things. things. Um, was it tricky to capture those, um, the right tone for those sections? Yeah, yeah, it was. You did a, a lovely reading of it. Um, it um, I rewrote those a lot. That was, that was the hard, maybe one of the hardest things stylistically. They started off being longer and kind of more like scenes. And then I realized at some point or another, they had to be short and a little incoherent. And um, to capture that sense of, she's having small strokes. And so she's in a memory unit and, um, and, um, and having a lot of all these up close memories. So those are very vivid and real to her. And then the other world is, is sort of not, as, as you were saying. And um, I think, um, so, you know, rhythm and sound became really important in terms of writing those. It's a little bit more like poetry. I think those sections are more lyrical. There's yeah. more imagery and, mm -hmm. um, and that way it was kind of fun to write it. I started off as a poet and I still write a lot of poetry. So um, I enjoyed the, that, that 
you know, using the poetic, being having a chance to really kind of um, use more poetic language than you normally would in fiction in those sections. Um, and um, there are a couple of images that sort of reoccur throughout all of them. And, and that's what started to get exciting in terms of images that I could build um, in terms of um, like kind of having more central metaphors. And one of them is that, is the sound that she hears in the hallways of the memory unit. Of course, the hallways of the memory unit are also the hallways of her mind. Right. Um, and, um, and, and so quite literally in the beginning when she first heard, hears this hum that's constant and coming and, and just is, she just is always hearing it here yeah, it's always in the background of everything it, it connects with the fact that at the festival arthur cohen is talking about that like he he wants to find the one sound that's underneath all other sounds and um and so it's almost as if she's found that and initially it is uh quite literally the um the heating unit that's under the building that's sending air through all the vents right but eventually i think the more and more as you were saying how you were reading one from further in yeah. to the novel so yeah. as her as her um she as her she's less in touch with reality and more deeply inside of herself that sound is her heartbeat at least in my mind by the end so that the one deep sound, the one true sound is the sound of the human heart. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting the way that, uh, the way that it kind of goes through, um, through these moments where they're very much in the present and then kind of instantly dips back into her memory is, um, it's, it's mostly, it's mostly quite seamless. And then there's, the, there's these few moments where as a reader, it's a little jarring, but I think that that, really speaks to, um, to what Rini's experiencing and Irene is experiencing in those moments. So yeah, it, uh, it really kind of helps bring you, bring you closer into, into her experience. Um, well, that, that's neat. I'll just say one thing about that that was hard and that I kind of got towards the end. I worked a lot on this is that um, trying to make those, to blend those, um, those worlds so that in terms of language, you sort of leave the memory unit and go into the memory. And there are a few sentences or maybe even a paragraph or so where they cross over. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That was tricky. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, well done. <laughs> um, so as, as, you, as you sort of mentioned in, um, in speaking about um, Rini and Arthur and their relationship. Um, as as Rini goes on with her life, she ha she has a lot of success. You know, she becomes the first female solo cello cellist um, with Boston's major symphony orchestra, um, and in a lot of ways has has even more success than some others who she thought would have would have more success. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it is it is so different than how she first pictured her life when she's in Newport and she just sees this clear vision of what her life is going to be. Um, so do you think that she felt accomplished uh, with the success that she had at the end of her life? Do you think it measured up to what she had initially pictured it would look like? I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, not completely because I guess I'm a realist in the end. And um, I don't think that, you know, it's not like you lose those, disappointments or overcome them but they kind of get folded into the rest of the fabric of your life I think and um, in the end I think you know she has a lot of successful parts of her life her daughter and, and her, her marriage and her and the um, and certainly her success playing music which is quite remarkable for that time period, even though she does struggle a lot. For years, she can only play with, a, the only orchestra she can play with is a, is a little civic orchestra, not up to her ability and talent, really. Um, except for the few other women in it who were, the other women in it who were also, you know, relegated to the civic orchestra, um, even though they were more remarkably talented. So, um, so I think that it's, it's it's mixed with that, but there is this irony, and I had, of course, I had fun with that. That um, Arthur Cohen, like many of the modern 
composers of that time period, and this is actually kind of sad, like many of the um, modern composers of the 1950s and 60s seem poised for success. They seemed like they were going to be the next big thing. And, and then, and many of them even won awards as Arthur Cohen does. He wins a, um, a Pulitzer at one point for a piece that hardly ever gets played because it's so, um, it's so difficult to play. A lot of these modern pieces are very hard for musicians to play. And so, um, and so, it, so it, by the end, you know, he's, he was kind of a flash in the pan a little bit, you know, um, his music isn't, played that often and he's not become a big name and yet she's she in her mind she's had this huge unexpected success that she was able to get up after years of struggle and hard work so uh so yeah. i liked that irony <laughs> i, I liked that, that as myself. well i liked that as well i mean it also just really speaks to how how very dedicated she was she um she really just purely, truly loved playing and performing music and worked very hard. Um, and, and it kind of, it, towards the end, I started going back to some of the conversations that she and Arthur had at the beginning um, where they argue over music and they argue over what music is. Yeah. And, and, um, and her, her perspective on, on what music is, that it's, that it's the notes, that it's pure sound is just, it's, it's kind of a reflection of her as a musician and as a person is that she is a, a purely dedicated and driven person and um, how much success that ended up bringing her. And Arthur well, that, kind of looked down on her a little bit for that, for having that perspective from the beginning. Yeah, well, I love it that you said that. That's something I hadn't thought of, but you're absolutely right, that in a way there's a, a, a continuity there, you know, a thread that stays. So there she was like in her very early 20s and um, and then late in life, that she's the same. That that is still there, you know. Um, that that devotion to the pure sound, and um, and and uh, as you said, sort of that that determination. Yeah, uh, she's like that till the end. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Hi, everyone. That was wonderful. So we do have some um, audience Q&A questions coming in. Um, so the first one is from, from Caitlin. She says, Karen, one thing that both you and Shannon have in common is being a teacher. Were there any teachers in your educational history that were particularly inspirational for you? Yeah, um, I would say a number of them. Um, uh, when I was at Arkansas, I was um, working on my MFA there for about four years, and um, uh, uh, Jim Whitehead was the head of the program then, and he wrote both fiction and poetry. He was a huge inspiration. I mean, he could, he could um, uh, dissect a poem like no one I've ever known since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he made me see language in a whole new way. Um, Carolyn Forche was there for a couple of years and I, I had studied a little with her as an undergraduate as well. She was a, a real inspiration for me. She was uh, deeply already into engaged in writing um, political poetry. And, um, and so that was, that was certainly an influence on me. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> And Shannon, you, um, another question that's come in, um, you mentioned in the beginning that um, you listen to uh, a lot of uh, classical music. Do you find in listening to, to classical music or any music really, um, that it influences your writing in, in any certain way? Do you find that the, the cadence of certain pieces enters your subconscious in a way that kind of comes out in your, in your writing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have to say when I was writing this, I was mostly listening to classical. I mean, it wasn't all modern. I listened to a lot of, um, you know, I love Bach. I listened to a lot of Bach concertos. I listened to um, Stravinsky, um, Dvorak. I listened to a lot of uh, different composers. Um, but, um, but it's not always classical. So sometimes it, I, I li have a really broad uh, palette, I guess. Um, <laughs> You know, so I listen to I listen to um, country music. I listen to the blues a lot, um, 
And I do find the rhythms uh, seeping into the work. So sometimes like you'd be drawn to listen to a certain kind of music um, while, I'm write, while I'm writing. Um, when I'm actually writing though, I can't listen to anything that has words in it. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's distracting. But often what I'll do is listen to it around the edges. Like, so I might listen to something as I'm getting ready to write or when I'm, when I'm sort of in between writing, writing something. So it's, I do feel like it has a big influence. And certainly um, language, you know, as a writer, you're very interested in the sounds of language. Um, so I think that's true for me as a fiction writer, not just as a poet. So um, the rhythms of the sentences and the, um, and the sounds of the words, you know, the kind of vowel sounds or consonant sounds, um, and all of those uh, contribute to the emotion of, that's being expressed. Um, and so that's a real commonality with music. I think. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, another question that's come in, um, what if any research did you have to do for, for this book? And were there any um, bits of research that, that you found that you, that you loved, but that you weren't necessarily able to work into, um, work into your work? Yeah, I did do a lot of research. Um, well, I went, a lot of, a good deal of it takes place in Newport, um, Rhode Island, um, around the area of the Breakers Mansion. So that was fun going down there. And I took a lot of photographs and, you know, walked, did, you know, walked along the cliff walk and kind of even further up on the island several times. That was really wonderful. Um, went through the mansions um, and that really helped me. And it helps, I really do try to see the settings of my book uh, in general. I've always done that. Um, in my second book takes place in the, in, in the Southwest in New Mexico. So I spent a couple of weeks there doing the same kind of research. Um, I think it's really uh, helpful to be able to envision where it's taking place because so much of the tone uh, feelings of the, of, the, of the book come from, from the setting. Um, and then I did a lot of research into the um, history of modern music and music, music in general, but the history of modern music. And, um, and, and I, I was a little in over my head, but I kind of enjoyed it. Uh, and, I, and there were a couple, I was out, I was, I was teaching, uh, um, guest teaching for a semester um, as a visiting fiction writer in, an MF, in a graduate program out at Bowling Green. And they have a very good music department there. And they had a couple, and they had a great music library with a couple of really helpful graduate students who kind of showed me sort of where to go and what to read. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of the things that I that I read that was really interesting that I wasn't really able to use much of, and this again connects to the history of the the political history that was going on then there as well, is they were they have um, the um, they have the uh, a musical con conference of composers in Germany every year, and um, and th that had been going on for years and years and years. So the year of my, when my novel takes place in 53, and then I read the couple that came, I guess a, a few years before that too, maybe I looked at five years, I was able to read the uh, transcripts of a lot of the lectures that were given on composing. And that was just um, really fascinating. And, and it just happened that uh, one of the concentration camps was right down the road in the next town to where this was being done. So that was referred to by some, in some of the lectures. So you could really see in those the um, influence that um, the way in which art is formed by uh, the bigger um, events and the bigger um, kind of feelings that are out there and, 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 and realizations that are going on um, in, throughout the world, really, in this case, because world, a world war had just ended. And, um, and it was referred to a lot in the lectures. So that, that was fascinating. I wish I could have included more of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting in the next, you know, six months to a year to five years, you know, what's, um, what's created from, from this moment in time, these moments in time. There, it feels like there are 50 going on at once right now. A um, couple more questions. Uh, another one from Caitlin. Uh, Karen, how did your experiences in male-dominated fields influence your writing about Rini's experiences as a female musician? 
Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, they did. Um, I will say that when I was in graduate school, I had very many wonderful experiences and I learned so much. So I'm not, I'm not, not uh, contradicting that by saying this next part. Um, but uh, I went into graduate school. One of the reasons I chose this particular program was they were going to let me write both fiction and poetry. I wanted to do both. And when I got there, I, real, I was told that I was a poet. Mm. And I was unable to write fiction while I was, I wrote some fiction, but I was unable to take, you know, the workshops and do the, I did, took a few of the courses, but I was unable to, to do them simultaneously. And I was unable to include any of it in my thesis. And um, I think at the time I was uh, in the way in which you're younger and when you're in the pool of what's, you know, you're kind of just trying to swim in the pool, right? So you don't really see what else is going on in the pool. I didn't get that. Like, I didn't get that that had something to do with the fact that I was in a very male-dominated program. There were very few women in the program. We, I was among the first entering class that had several, uh, more women in it. And, um, and uh, when I got out, it, it occurred to me that, gee, all of the women were poets. <laughs> and there were only a couple of women who were writing fiction. And that the novel in particular, because I wanted to write work on a novel, I didn't want to write short fiction, the mm -hmm. novel in particular that wasn't being written, and that's what they thought was the epitome of writing, you know, like if you were really good, you could write a novel. It also was at the time the only thing that you could really earn some money off of writing, which kind of uh, is similar to what was happening in the, with for m women musicians. They were allowed to play, but you know, if it was a paying position, like in the symphony orchestra, those, those positions were re reserved for men. So um, I could have been really discouraged by being told over and over again that I couldn't write fiction and I didn't have the voice for it and I didn't have the ability to do it. But when I realized that, it was about two or three years after I got out of grad school, I just thought, I'm gonna write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, and I just, and I did it and that was patchwork. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that, yeah. actually, that's really interesting. I'm going to go back. My dad's a writer as, as everybody on the call probably knows at this point. Um, but I, I'll be interested to, to actually ask him, you know, the next time, the next time I see him and ask him how many, how many female graduate students were in his MFA class that were specialized? Yeah. I mean, it may have been different in other programs. This was yeah. in the 1980s. Yeah. Um, so kind of yeah. mid 80s. Yeah. This would have been the 80s for him too at the, the University of Arizona in, uh, in Tucson in the early 80s when I was born. So no, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to ask him. You check that out. <laughs> piqued my interest. All right, yeah. uh, one final question for you both. Um, what are you reading right now and who do you consider um, some of your, your favorite and most inspirational writers? Oh, that gosh. <laughs> You want to go first, Shannon? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just finished a book by at The End of the Point by Elizabeth Graver, which I thought was excellent and um, an, an incredible read. And um, um, she and she lives, I believe she still lives in Boston, it said in the back of the cover. Um, and I'm also reading a lot of, of, of poetry. I've been rereading um, a, a collection, the collected works of Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I also recently read, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it now, Unsung, Sing Unsung, uh, Jasmine Ward's uh, novel. Which oh, Sing I, Unmarried Sing, yeah. Thing, yeah, which I just thought, that was the one I read before the end of the point, and I just thought that was fabulous as well. Um, and an incredible voice. And it reminded me of one of the writers who influenced me a great deal, which is Toni Morrison. Um, and... Um, I think, you know, mo most writers of my generation were very much influenced by her. And I remember um, reading Beloved and being like having to go back and start it all over again. It's like, wow, a novel can do this? Like, I didn't know that until I, until I read her. Um, and I was also influenced a lot by uh, Virginia Woolf. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, Eudora Welty, a lot of women writers. Uh, I think I do have a, I don't know if I have a distinctively female voice, but I think uh, to an extent, I've been told I do, I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> nothing, wrong. <laughs> nothing wrong with Nothing wrong, right, right, right.
Do you want to say, Shannon? Sure. Um, I mean, I will say currently, and as of the last couple of years, most of what I read is um, is, is books for three, four, and five year olds. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> books that are much shorter than this one. Um, but well, I name um, a few of those. Those are great. You've got some great <laughs> books that you read. For your oh, kids. I do. I do. We do. Um, we read some really wonderful books. We read a lot of um, Ezra Jack Keats, which are some of my my personal favorites with my kids. Um, but I also. Um, I've always loved Grandpa. I've always loved um, Barbara King Solver um, and Anita, Anita, uh, Anita Shreve are two of my favorite my favorite authors who are also distinctly female voices. I would say um, who also write a lot about um, do a lot of really really wonderful uh, character work and tell really wonderful great stories. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Anita Shreve was was great, and uh, I we 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 connected early on because we had the same editor for a while and. Uh, She's a wonderful writer. She she had an influence on me also, and on 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 my um, yeah throughout my life. Um, she, she, for a while, she lived up near here, which was great. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here tonight, and thank you to to everyone who has um, who has attended. As a reminder, the link to buy the book is in the chat box. Um, so thank you again and um, enjoy, enjoy your weekend that's coming up. Yeah, you yeah. too. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you for your wonderful moderating of the event and hosting it. Yeah, thank you. This was wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good night. Have a good, good night. night.